All right, well, I think we can go ahead and get started and people can continue to sort of trickle in. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to this Artist Talk with Brent Learned. I am Sarah Carlson. I'm the Curator of Collections at the University of Denver Museum of Anthropology. And together with Jean and Merv from the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival, we are all so excited to be gathered here today. And I know I'm sure we're all experts at Zoom by now, but I wanna let you all know that we are in a webinar format. So that means, unfortunately, I can't see your beautiful faces, um, but we do wanna encourage you to ask questions and interact with us. Um, so I wanna direct you to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So um, go ahead and direct all of your questions there and um, we'll address them later during the Q&A session at the end. Um, so Brent's fantastic artwork is featured in our new collaborative virtual exhibit places of memory. And I am going to drop the link to that in the chat. There it is. So that you can all see it and access it and experience it. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and drop my email in there. So if you have any issues accessing the link, you can go ahead and let me know and we'll see what we can do to resolve that. Um, so the exhibit link will take you to the main page of the exhibition where you can read the film festival. Oops, yes, I do. One second. Okay, here is the exhibit link. And here is my email. So the exhibit link will take you to the main page of the exhibition where you can read the film festival's interpretation of the exhibit theme. And then underneath that, you can click on the link under Brent's name and it will take you to his page so you can see his amazing artwork. Um, so I'd also like to just let you know that the second page of the exhibition will feature artwork by Greg Deal who will be joining us for another artist talk on July 21st. So please keep an eye out for more information about that. Um, as well as for two future um, panels that we'll be collaborating on with the film festival. So the first is, what are the roles of indigenous artists, museums, un and universities in creating and sacralizing places of memory on June 30th at 1 p.m.? And the second, indigenizing museums will be on August 19th at 1 p.m. So please keep an eye out for additional information, additional emails about those panels, because those will be coming. Um, but we are so excited to get into the discussion with Brent today. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Jean Rubin and Merv Tano from the Indigenous Film and Art Festival so that we can get the program started. Thank you all for coming today. Welcome, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the 17th Annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival presented by the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. <clears throat> I'm Jean Rubin, I direct the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. With me is Merv Tano, he is our Institute President. The festival would not be possible without the support of our sponsors and community partners. So as always, I will start by acknowledging our major sponsors. Our premier sponsors are this year, our Arts and Society, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Our presenting sponsors are Kanika Minolta and Colorado Creative Industries. Our community partners that you'll see on the next slide also play a major role hosting events and providing all manner of support. So a big thank you to all of our sponsors and community partners. <clears throat> this is our first virtual film festival. We started last fall with the film screenings, and we're now moving to the art portion of the festival. And I wanna say we truly could not have mounted this art exhibit without the support of the DU Museum of Anthropology and the untiring efforts of Anna Mati, Sarah Carlson, and of course, the museum director, Christina Kreps. They did a phenomenal job working with the artists to curate the exhibit creating a stunning virtual platform to display the art and hosting a series of four live programs, all, all which complement the exhibit. So that brings us to tonight's artist's talk with Brent Learned. It was nearly two years ago that we extended an invitation to Brent to be part of our exhibit on places of memory. The theme resonated with him and he immediately accepted our invitation. It is no exaggeration to say I have been anticipating this night for two years, and it is with great pleasure 
that I introduce Brent Lerner. Hi, how, how's everyone going? Thank you for uh, tuning in tonight. And I also want to thank uh, the University of Denver Arts uh, Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Also, Anne, uh, Jean, Merv, and Sarah for their, for their work on this project. Um, when, uh, when I was approached by Jean about this project, it, uh, it kind, of, kind of really hit home with me with a the theme, Places of Memory. Um, I, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm uh, one of uh, 10 kids from uh, Juanita and John Leonard. My father was white, my mother was Indian. And uh, one of the things that they always stress to us is you got to know where you came from to know where you're going in life. And so I was always brought up with the, the understanding of where my people came from. And what I usually do with my artwork, I try to incorporate that to tell, to tell those stories of my ancestors, to give them a voice, because I, I look at it this way, they didn't have a, a voice that they could actually tell their story. And so I'm kind of basically reaching back into the past and telling their story through my artwork. And, um, but, but, but before I begin with the, the presentation, I'd, I'd like to tell you about my mom and dad. <laughs> my mother, you know, she was the uh, first woman chairperson of the Cheyenne Arapaho. And uh, growing up, I, I never really knew what my mother, you know, did. And, uh, you know, she'd come home and kind of tell us about what she had to do for the tribe and, and, and what she was wanting to get back for, for our people. And on the other hand, my father, he was an artist. And so I kind of grew up in, in a mixture of the art and this culture that my mother gave to me. And so I just kind of intermingled those two together. And so growing up, I would watch my father sculpt and uh, paint. And so that kind of gave me the love towards uh, painting and drawing. And, uh, you know, I went through uh, school, you know, winning competitions and, and uh, doing different uh, exhibitions. And when I went to the University of Kansas for art school, um, one of the things I did was, uh, you know, try to tell my story of what it's like to be an indigenous uh, artist. And um, after graduating, you know, my mom said, you know, I'd really like for you to do pieces that depict, you know, our tribe. Because like all young artists do, they, they see images that Curtis Edwards has put out and William Soule, and they, they replicate those. And, and, I, and I also did that as well when I first began. But one of the things that I wanted to do was kind of tell more of the Cheyenne Arapaho narrative, tell their story. And so through my art in the last few years, one of the things I try to stress is, you know, you got to know where, where you came from to know where you're going in life. And, um, and one of those things that uh, it res resonates with my work is, is that you see these paintings and, and, and it tells you the story and the struggle of what my people had gone through. And, um, and it's one of the things that I'm really proud of. And, and again, I'm, I'm really excited to show you some of these images. So if we can begin uh, with the first image, Sarah. This is a piece that I called Sand Creek Genocide. It's a take on Pablo Picasso's Guernica. And if you're not familiar with uh, Guernica, uh, it was a piece that uh, Picasso did in uh, the late 30s. And it was a, a piece that was depicting the, uh, the bombing of Guernica by the Nazis and the, uh, the Italian fascists. And in it, it, uh, it showcases a lot of uh, horror and, and tragedy that had happened. And what, I, what I've done with, uh, with these pieces in this exhibition is I've gone through and picked artists that kind of resonated with me growing up looking at a lot of art history books and that really spoke to me. And, and, and this was one of the pieces that really spoke to me was a, uh, one of uh, Picasso's most famous piece. And what I've done with this is I'm telling the story of Sand Creek and also giving you a little taste of uh, the, uh, it's a famous painting called Manifest Destiny. So if you, if you look at the piece, you see the, the buffalo. The buffalo to me represents that the young braves who went out that morning to go hunt while the, the older people were back at Sand Creek. And then from there, when, they, when the uh, tragedy happened on November the, uh, 
the uh, 29th, 1864, which happened during the Civil War, mind you, the uh, the cavalry struck at, at uh, that morning, and they they killed a lot of old women and men and, and kids. Matter of fact, the kids they they use this uh, target practice, and so this is a, a piece that's depicting the Sand Creek Massacre of all that uh, tragedy and horror that had happened that day. And then if you look a little to the the right of the piece, you see the woman with a the little torch. Well, that's manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is this conception that uh, <laughs> that whites were here here to uh, to take the land from this, the noble savage, and that they're they're basically just wanting to to uh, extinguish us. And so I, I wanted to put a piece that, for one, it's one of Picasso's most famous and emotional pieces. But again, I wanted to take that and and, and use that in this piece with the uh, the Sand Creek. And um, you can see the, the devastation that had happened. You see the, the uh, horses trampling the women and the young kid who died and the woman who's, who just got shot and then the old man who, who got shot in the back. And so, again, this is one of those pieces that, to me, speaks volumes about what happened in the, in the tragedy at Sand Creek. And the one thing that I learned, because a few years ago, I put together an exhibition with my uh, my cousin George Levi, and it's called One November Morning. And uh, we did an exhibition at the University of Denver. We did one at Northwestern University. And the one thing that we found when we talked to a lot of the participants who came and heard our talk was they didn't hear about Sand Creek. It was one of those things that, yeah, yeah we heard about it for a day, but we moved on, especially in, the, in Colorado, when it came to Colorado history. And when we went to Chicago uh, to talk at Northwestern, a lot of those kids who attended uh, Northwestern University didn't understand the the, uh, the the implications that their founder had in the hand that he had at Sand Creek. And so for, for them, it was kind of an eye opening because one of the things that I've learned, you know, in my many years of uh, traveling is a lot of people, when it comes to Indian artwork, they just, they don't, for one, they, it's kind of new to them and two, when it comes to Indian history, they, they really never taught that in school. And so as an artist, I, I look at myself as an, an ambassador of my tribe and also somebody who goes out and educates the public about what happened to my people. And so again, this is a, a piece that uh, speaks volumes to me. And, and again, it's called uh, Sand Creek uh, Genocide. You can go to the next image. This piece is a Cheyenne grandmother. And, and the place of memory for this piece, uh, just bear with me for a second. It was uh, basically the, the loved one that she had lost. Because again, when it comes to places of memory, to me, it, there, it could be anything. It could be the first time you, you had a kiss, or the first time you, you've heard about the stories of where you came from, or first song that reminds you of a you know, of a, an incident that happened to make you who you are. And so this piece uh, for me is a, a place, a memory is the place of uh, the, the, uh, the loved one that is lost and that uh, she, she can't wait till she's reunited with him. And, it, and it's a take on uh, James Whistler's piece, uh, Whistler's mother. And uh, in it, it, she's holding a, his tobacco bag, reminiscing about what it was like to to be with him when he when she first saw him and and uh just reminiscing about all the other times that they were together and then just right above her is kind of a, a little depiction of her lost loved one and uh and again it's one of those pieces that kind of speaks to kind of to all of us because you know we all get to a point where you know you think of loved ones that have come and gone you know, and if you could just see them one more time, what would you say? The, uh, let's go to the next piece. And this is this is a buffalo, and uh, the the uh, the place in the memory on this one is is what what the buffalo means to not only the Cheyenne Arapaho but pretty much all Indians in the plains. It meant food. It meant clothing. It meant uh, medicine 
it meant utensils. You know, believe it or not, the uh, the buffalo had 150 uses. And uh, when uh, they would hunt them, they hunted them after they did a ceremony. Because if you killed a buffalo not in ceremony, then you would have brought bad medicine to the tribe. And so usually that person was exiled out of the, the tribe. And that was the, the worst worst thing that could happen to somebody and uh but this you know the buffalo meant life to our people you know we, we traveled wherever it went and um my indian name hana ja nioto means buffalo bull howling like it's howling at the moon and the way i received my indian name was through my aunt who's the the oldest in uh in my family and that's how you 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 typically receive your uh, your name, uh, especially in my tribe, the Cheyenne Arapaho. You you typically receive it from the from the elder. And uh, I went with my mom uh, to go see my aunt, and she asked me. She goes, well, "What what uh, what do you like doing?" And I said, well, "I like painting," you know. And she goes, "Well, what do you like painting?" Mom says, "Well, he really likes my maiden name, which was Howling Buffalo." And she goes, he, she, he really likes to paint buffalo. And so she did a play on words and she called me Buffalo Bull Howling. And that's how I received my Indian name. But then again, the, you know, like I said, uh, when I, with this piece, I wanted something that would show a strong, you know, buffalo with a lot of color. So when you, when you look at it, your eye wants to wander. But then again, it's, you have to look past that to really see what that image is and what it means to the Plains Indian. Again, it was life. Go ahead into the next image. This piece I did during the uh, first uh, couple of months of the, uh, the pandemic, because uh, one of the things I noticed was uh, a, a lot of people, you know, when it, when it happened, you know, for one, we were all shocked that it, it could happen in our lifetime. And, uh, you know, the last time a pandemic happened was in 1917. And so to have it in your lifetime and, and not expect it was, uh, was kind of shocking. And so what I wanted to do was to do some, some pieces for my tribe so they could get the word out and to protect our elders and uh, to let people know, you know, how to, you know, to do social distancing, wash your hands, uh, wear your mask. And so I did a, a bunch of pieces that would protect and get the message out and uh, try to protect our elders because, uh, you know, when, when your elders are gone, a lot of those stories go with them. And uh, one of the things I, I've been wanting to do, and, and I have reached out to some elders to, to try to get some of those stories. So that way, when they pass on, we can share it for the next generation. But this was a, a piece that I did during the coronavirus to to showcase one of the things that you should do is is to wear wear your mask and protect others and uh, to think of others go to the next image this is a a, a take on the greek uh, son of man french can i let, let me uh, interject for a second because we had a uh, we had a question and somebody asked if you would also um, speak to what medium you use for each of these images. Uh, all the pieces, all the pieces are done uh, in acrylic on canvas. They're all done in acrylic on canvas. And uh, this piece right here is a take on uh, Magritte's Son of Man, where in Magritte's uh, version, it's an apple. And so, and again, I I wanted to kind of tell the the Plains Indian, especially in my tribe, the Cheyenne Arapaho story. And so apples weren't indigenous to North America, especially to the Plains Indian. But what was, was uh, choke cherries. So these are choke cherries in front of a, an Arapaho. The Arapaho I, I used in this image is a little bird because I'm, I'm very fond on how he dressed and, and wore his feather. And so again, this was kind of a, a take on, on that piece. And uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, but that was a a, a take on uh, Magritte's uh, 
piece and then the, the place of memory if you can just give me one second because i i because i did these a while ago and then i'm still i'm trying to remember what what i had uh, said of each one um just give me one second i apologize for that so while while brent is looking for that let me just remind the audience you can put your questions into the chat into the i'm not the chat the q a at any time uh because uh, brent is reserving time at, at the end to answer questions so feel free to start typing them in uh, let's see Uh, hold on, hold on. So for folks who have not yet had a chance to visit the exhibit, all of these images are posted and Brent has um, <clears throat> provided a wonderful detailed text for each image and also um, a Cheyenne and Arapaho proverb for each image. So after the, uh, the talk, if you haven't already seen the exhibit, please uh, do visit it. It's fantastic. Yeah, just give me one second. I, and again, I apologize because I had it ready and, the, and I lost my place on my, my tablet here. Well, I can go for a long time about how wonderful I think you, these works of art are. So you just, you just give me the signal when you're ready to start. Uh, it would just, it will be just one second. And again, I apologize. One of the great things about working with Brent and Anne and Sarah as all the images come in is you get to live with the images for a long time and uh, they really are uh, beautiful and interesting and tell some interesting stories they they, they do okay and this one this is the the, the uh, places of time where uh, uh, the food that they had uh, and again, it reminds them of what it was like at that time. <laughs> and it was the uh, the choke cherries. So we'll, we'll go to the next image. I, I, again, I apologize for that. This one was the uh, the Arapaho with red uh, robe. And uh, the place of memory is the the gift of receiving a, a blanket. And that's that's one of the highest honors you could receive is receiving something that would keep you warm and something that you can remember the people that gave it to you. I remember my mother when she was the, uh, the chief of the tribe and uh, she would come home from, from different powwows or different events. And she always had a, like a bundle of uh, different Pendletons. And uh, I asked mom, you know, as a little kid, I go, where did you get those? And she goes, I got them from different people. They gave it to me as an honor and to show respect for, for what I've done for, for our people. And so when you give somebody a blanket, you're giving them more to show that you care. It's like the old uh, the saying that uh, has gotten misconstrued over the year, uh, Indian giver. You know, when I first learned the actual meaning of that, not what it means, what people think it means now, which is, you know, you give something and you want it back. The original term to that was when you gave some, something, especially like the shirt off your back to show that, hey, you know, you're my friend now. You know, I care about you. You're one of us. And, and that was one of the things that mom always taught me about with what my tribe is, is that to show respect, you always give them a gift and to show that you care. And to say no is refusal. Yeah, that's it's almost an insult. So, you know, if somebody wants to give you something. You always want to receive it and tell them thank you. And so this was a. Uh, a piece that I, I did to showcase a, a place of memory of, of uh, receiving a, a, a blanket that which was, was, meant, went, was meant as a high honor to receive a blanket. 
Let me go to the next image. And this one is a uh, the Arapaho. And uh, I'm typically known to, to do this kind of a style. And it's um, kind of, you know, I, I look at it as kind of a, um, you know, Santa Fe kind of style with the bright, bold colors and everything else. And, you know, I wanted to show, you know, a lot of the characteristics in the, in the, in the man's face. And, uh, and again, I always like to, to sign my work with my Indian name and always showcase Arapaho out of respect for my mom because uh, she was saying there's, there's so many Cheyenne artists and she goes that she goes, you are Cheyenne and you're also Arapaho, but she goes, you never hear about the Arapaho in, in any of the books for some reason. They're always kind of an afterthought, even when you, they talk about the little, uh, the battle of the little bighorn, which is known as the, the greasy grass. They're always referred, uh, you always hear Cheyenne, Lakota, and then Arapaho. And so mom, she was very proud of being Arapaho. And so I always try to sign uh, my work uh, to show the love for my mom and uh, the place of memory for this piece uh, was, um, you know, just remembering Arapaho Indians and, and the struggle that the, they had gone through in their life, you know, because of the, the one thing about my, my work is that granted they're, the, it's very colorful and you see, you know, the face and, the imagery and what they wore with the regalia and they're all done in bright colors but I kind of want you to look past that and to see what it was like for that person at that time when things were slowly being taken away from them from when they were out on the plains to look slowly being assimilated and put on reservation and how one generation that was all kind of taken away from them and um, and how we're now going back and looking at what some of the atrocities that had happened to not only my tribe, but uh, indigenous people around the world. And so again, this was a piece that was in, to indicate a uh, place of memory of being an Arapaho and the struggles of what it was like to, for him at that time. Let me go to the next piece. This is a piece that that's, uh, speaks to my Cheyenne uh, part. And it's a, it's in a take on a uh, Michelle Basquiat. Because for one, again, I love color and I love expressing myself. And Michel Basquiat uh, was one of those artists that he was he was a master at that. And uh, this is a piece that de is depicting a uh, Cheyenne dog soldier. Cheyenne dog soldiers were uh, referred to as the uh, Spartans of the plain because they actually had a, sh uh, a sash that they would literally pin themselves and then sacrifice themselves for others to, to get away. And so this is a, a piece that I'm paying homage to the Cheyenne dog soldiers. And um, in, that, in the, the place of memory for this is, you know, the sacrificing of other, uh, sacrificing yourself for others uh, to uh, preserve their way of life. And, um, you know, the, the, the Cheyenne dog soldiers, uh, were, were very fierce. Even the, the cavalry, when they came upon them, they, they didn't like to fight them. They'd rather retreat and, and turn around. And um, I did a piece a few years ago that uh, depicted a, uh, the Cheyenne dog soldiers. Because the dog soldiers are the only ones who wore the bonnet that had the feathers all branched, uh, sticking out. And it's a, it's a beautiful uh, bonnet that they wear. And in um, and the piece that I did a few years ago uh, depicted the uh, the signing of the um, Medicine uh, Lodge uh, Treaty, which they signed in uh, Medicine Lodge, Kansas. And uh, in that piece, I, I depict a bunch of Cheyenne dog soldiers uh, in, a, in a group on horseback. And it, it comes from uh, uh, General Reno, uh, not Reno's, uh, General uh, 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 Sherman, um, when he talked about in his uh, memoirs about one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen. And he said it was uh, when the dog soldiers lined up at the, the Meta Medicine uh, uh, Creek uh, Treaty up in uh, Kansas. Now you can go to the next piece. This is a uh, piece on um, called uh, uh, Cheyenne Indian, 
owe to uh, Henry Botice. And um, the image that you see with the red, that's a symbol, that's a Cheyenne symbol for a heart. And uh, in this piece, I wanted to, to pay homage to the, the Cheyenne uh, Indian. And uh, the uh, place of memory is, is the, the, the heart that, uh, that they had had, had and, the, and the strength that they had as a people and the uh, resilience of, of traveling around and how the, the cavalry and would move them from one place to another, but they still had the heart to stay with one another and uh, be who they were. You know, they were they uh, migrated from um, from Canada down and in, uh, into the Colorados and the, the South Dakota, and then um, from there we we split because we have the southern and the, the northern band. The southern band came down to Oklahoma, and the northern band uh, stayed up in uh, the uh, the Colorado, South Dakota, and the Black Hill area, and. Uh, Again, this was a piece that uh, uh, was done in a Henry Motis kind of a uh, uh, impressionist uh, type style uh, using those colors uh, that uh, would, you would have typically seen in a Henry Motis piece. But uh, this piece is uh, to represent the love of being uh, in, in the pride that he has of being a, a Cheyenne. We go to the next piece. This this piece is a a, a counting coup, and uh, in order to become a man, and uh, especially in uh, plains culture, you you had to count coup. And uh, this piece is uh, depicting a uh, Cheyenne on horseback uh, stealing some horses, and. Uh, it's done in the old traditional ledger artwork, which is also known as pictorial artwork. Pictorial artwork being that it's, you know, done uh, with simple line drawing. And uh, they traditionally drew this on uh, rocks and hides. And as paper was introduced, they, they went from the hide drawings because on hides, you can only do so much. But once paper was introduced, they were able to branch out and tell more stories of uh, courageous battles and in uh, different events that had happened in, in a person's life. And uh, one of the first uh, uh, ledger drawings that is documented is by a little Cheyenne boy at, uh, in 1843, I believe. And uh, in the, a lot of the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho art uh, uh, Indians that were sent down to uh, 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 Florida in a prison camp uh, they were given ledger paper and from there they were a lot of them drew and depicted events that they remember being when they were out on the plains and so uh, for for my people the Cheyenne Arapaho the the ledger paper is the traditional the their traditional uh, drawing of uh, of our uh, the Cheyenne Arapaho people and uh, the the um, place of memory for this is uh, the risk and the escape of, uh, of surviving and, and, and uh, recording a, uh, a bravery act that they had had. The next, next image. And this is a image also done in the uh, ledger style depicting a courtship. And uh, in this piece, you know, they, it was the first time this, Couples getting together, they're they're talking about what the future holds. But it's uh, one of those things that when they when they got married, they the families would get together and they would trade, you know, so many horses or they would give so many gifts. But this is a, a piece on basically the first encounter of a uh, of the of the love of his life, and so they're they're uh, just kind of filling each other out and seeing what's going on. And the, uh, the place of memory of this is is love. You guys have any questions up to now? We both do, but let me let me jump in. Uh, Brent, you had you had shared with me um, why 
why you started doing the the odes to some of those better, you know, those well-known artists with some of their famous pieces that I thought was really interesting. Could you share that with our audience? Uh, one of the reasons I I did that was to uh, for one to kind of showcase my skill as an artist, but uh, two is to kind of show people that you know if they if those artists were were indigenous, how would that piece actually look? Uh, you know, how would it actually be done in a stylized uh, form? And so, you know, they, they kind of started out with, a, uh, I looked at different uh, master's work and just kind of reinterpreted it into a kind of a native uh, feel. And, um, and we'll, you know, one of them, we can go back to the, the Guernica one, the, the Picasso one. she's got it. This is one of the first ones we we, we showed. Yeah, you know, that piece. I and mean, like I said, if you were to look at the the original done by uh, Picasso, very much similar line in, in uh, placement of the images, but then again, it's it's a, a lot different with you know with the adding the teepees and the bonnet and the buffalo. It's got more of a, a native feel. And again, it, it, I did this piece in, in the aspect that if Picasso was Indian, how would he, how would he have interpreted that painting in, in, uh, at that time? And, uh, and I've done this with other, other master pieces. I've done it with uh, Leonardo, um, Monet, Ruben, Veneer, Picasso. And again, I just kind of want to showcase some of my uh, painting skills because uh, one of the things I've noticed with a, when it comes to a lot of artists is that, uh, you know, they, they kind of do the same thing, you know, and as an artist, I feel that if you, you, you need to grow with your artwork, if you're doing the same thing that you did 10 years ago when you first started out and you're still doing it now, there's no growth. And then, like I said, if you were to look at my body of work and you go back, 10, even 20, 25 years, it's, it's always different. Um, it's always changing. It's always growing. It's always becoming something different. It's always morphing into to something completely different. And again, it's all, but it, but the narrative is still the same. And that, that narrative is, is telling the story of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho in different ways. And just kind of telling that story about how resilient we are as a people and how we, we survived no matter what was, what was handed to us. And um, with each piece, again, I feel that I'm kind of giving my ancestors a voice and, and letting them speak through the colors of my, the paint that I put on the canvas. And, and you know, and every brush stroke and, and every, um, slab of uh, paint that I throw on there, I feel that I'm kind of preserving uh, the history of my people. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I've learned from, from doing art over the last, you know, 25 years is that, you know, I'm still learning, you know, I'm still growing as an artist and uh, I haven't really quite hit my peak and, uh, and I always try to encourage other artists to, to try to push themselves to, you know, to dig inside and, and, and to tell your, your, your tribe stories. Because again, you know, I've seen so many artists that will depict a Cheyenne or an Arapaho, but they distort it. They, they change up the regalia on the man and, and what he's wearing. I said, when you, when you do that, you, you change who that person is because that's his medicine. That's who he was. You know, you could literally look at a Cheyenne or an Arapaho and you can tell just by looking at him what he had done in his life. And, and then I said, that's, those are stories that I should be telling, you know, your, your Cherokee or your Choctaw or your Comanche, why are you telling those stories? You know, you, you, your, your tribe has that same history. There's stories that you you should be telling from your tribe. And, uh, and I'd like to see more of that when it comes to, uh, a lot of uh, young uh, native artists. I'd like to see them tell stories that uh, 
about their tribe and, and some of the the, the uh, tribulations that they had gone through, you know, because, you know, how, how often have you seen paintings of Chief Joseph, Geronimo, Sitting Bull, uh, you know, you can go to any, any Indian art show and you're going to see that, you know, but I, I'd like to see stories that tell another side of the story to where we're not being defeated, to where we're res resilient and, and, and seeing everyday life, what it was actually like at that time. Because again, I'm painting images and depicting images that happened over 150, 200 years ago. And, you know, so I'm somewhat of an historian of the moment, trying to reach back and tell those stories. And so what I usually do before I do a piece is I, I research it. I try to find a, a kind of a, a story and a narrative in there that I could pull out and put on canvas. And uh, that's, that's something that uh, I just don't see too much uh, nowadays. Some artists are doing it, don't get me wrong. And I sound like I'm kind of critical, but I'd like to see more of that. So uh, Brett, we have a, someone has a follow-up question to my question, um, wanting to know what you consider your signature style in your own technique and approach? Uh, if, if I had to pick one, it would be the, like the Arapaho Indian piece that uh, we showed you a little bit ago with the bright colors that I referred to as kind of a, a Santa Fe, that, that type of stuff. Because it's, to me, it's just, I feel real loose when I paint that. You know, I feel, you know, just like, it almost like it paints itself. And, and it's, and it's, they're fun to do, don't get me wrong, but I, I kind of want to challenge myself because I, I don't want to be kind of pigeonholed to where I'm only known for one type of style. I want to be one of these artists that's very diversified to where you're like, man, I can't tell which, if Brent did that or if he didn't, because it was so, it's so different in, in the style and the story that it's telling. And again, that was one of the main reasons I went back and I was looking at old master's work that's, that have st stood this, uh, the test of time and try to put it into a narrative of uh, being an American Indian and what it would be like if they painted that. But if I, if, but if I had to pick a style right now, it would be the, uh, the bright bold color type pieces is what I'm known for. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, Murph Tano here. One of the challenges uh, uh, I have personally in, in, in uh, defining places of memory uh, is that uh, so much of it is uh, is very, very contextualized. A place uh, can be any, can be a, a mountain range, uh, but it, it can be uh, a bedroom. And even in a bedroom, it can be a, uh, the, uh, the top drawer where uh, uh, grandma uh, had her beadwork. There is a, I, I think one of the challenges that uh, we have as an institute in, in uh, uh, defining that, that, uh, that issue or the question of, uh, you know, what is a place of memory? Uh, how does that, uh, do you go through that kind of uh, uh, angst or uh, introspection as you kind of connect up uh, your art with with a memory uh, and uh, specifically with with a place well you know with a, with several of the pieces because I literally these pieces that you you see I, I literally did for this for this exhibition and so in that in that aspect I kind of had preconceptions of what each one was going to be in um in the kind of the, the narrative i was going to go with but but literally the work that i do outside outside of this exhibition 
uh, goes along with that that narrative of places of memory of you know what it was like the first time they they hunted buffalo or the the first time they they scalped somebody or or when you had a, a fallen comrade in battle what it was like for them to kind of feel those emotions and everything because one of the things about art is that it it pulls and, and tears at you in, in different ways and for me it's one of those things that I wanted to kind of express that in pretty much every type of piece that I do I want to take you out of the of the moment you're in into a, a different world to to experience that moment and kind of relive it through the the painting as you as you see it as a viewer thank you we have a, another question uh, someone wants to know how much your father's art influenced you uh, my dad's uh, work influenced me quite a bit and uh Matter of fact, I, I miss him uh, quite a uh, quite a quite a lot because uh, my father he he meant a lot to me as well as my mother, but my mother she she passed away when I was twenty six, and so you know during that time I was in college and by the time I have moved moved back to Oklahoma I only got to spend just a little time with her before she had passed, and so my the memories of my mom were were just as a little kid growing up because mom was always gone doing, you know, tribal work and, and, uh, and really out in the community trying to help others. And so my father, he was kind of a stay home dad to where, you know, he raised all of us. And, and one of the things he did was we would help him with his artwork. And, Cause again, he was a sculptor he painted. And so watching him and do his, do his craft, uh, we'd sit there and I'd ask him kind of, kind of question, you know, all kinds of questions. Cause I was, very inquisitive as a kid, you know, why did you do that? Or why is that there? And so dad would sit there and he would tell me, you know, the reasons why he was doing that, because he goes, you know, I'm, I'm depicting a certain tribe here and this is how they wore their hair and this is how they wore their feather. And, and so he, you know, so I was basically, I was getting a history lesson as a young man from my father, just watching him sculpt. And so growing up, when I'd come home from, from college, you know, dad and I would sit around for hours and, and just talk about, you know, different battles and, and the different customs that we, you know, he had read about and he would uh, re reference different books that I should read. And, and uh, all the way up until uh, the day he passed, uh, you know, we, we would literally sit around and just, just talk about what it was like back then, you know, and he always kind of put me in a place to where I felt like I was there experiencing that with him as we watched these events. And, um, you know, dad had a way with the way he spoke to where he had a commanding voice to where you, you wanted to listen, you wanted to, to learn more. You know, he's one of these guys that he was introverted. And so he didn't really like to talk to people, but when, when you met him and he opened up, you couldn't, you couldn't shut him up. You know, he, he continued to talk because he, uh, he, 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 he had the passion and love for, for the American Indian. And, uh, and, like, and again, I, I was very privileged to have a mother and father that I did because it, again, I had that nurtured in me since I was a kid. And, and again, one of the things that mom and dad always stressed to, to each one of my brothers and sisters is they said that when you leave the house, you leave with that last name, my last name. You leave with your integrity. You always want to treat people the way you want to be treated. You always want to push somebody to where they can better themselves and, and, and always try to better the community because if you better the community, everyone benefits from that. And, and, and the other thing was is you always want to try to try to, to try to push yourself to be the, the best person you, you possibly can be. And uh, those things have always were basically ingrained in me. And so I always try to do that with fellow artists and, and uh, other people that I, I come across in, uh, in life. And uh, even when I go to different shows, I always try to encourage an artist going, Hey, you did this, but, man, if you did that, that would, you know, you're, you're telling another story and, and try to push them, 
because we all we all get pushed in a, in a certain direction and and again i always try to try to better uh, other artists and uh and uh, but that's one of the things that i i miss about my father because again it was the the camaraderie of the stories and just seeing him do his craft and him enjoying it and um and again by me doing what i'm doing i feel like he's living through me with the, the work that i do as well and uh <laughs> are there any other questions i'd be more than happy to answer anything Well, just real quick. Uh, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I don't know if you know uh, uh, Daniel uh, Wildcat uh, out of Haskell. Uh, he's a uh, UG, uh, I've known him for years. Uh, and we were talking about places of memory and, and, and how art uh, uh, plays a, a, such an important role in kind of uh, capturing those memories and those and those places but one of the things that uh, he said that uh, really struck me and uh, i'd like to get your reaction to it uh, he said that when you're talking about places and you're talking about memory generally speaking it's it's not the kind of thing that you uh, uh, you experience uh, uh, by yourself sometimes that happens but in most cases, it's about relationships. It's about who was there, uh, what, uh, who that person uh, was to uh, uh, to you. Uh, could have been an ally. Could have been an uh, 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 an anti, or, or could be an could have been an enemy. But it's you know the point he made was that uh, it's always this kind of uh, context. And the context uh, is what is important to the narrative. Um, how does an artist uh, kind of capture those kinds of uh, uh, relationships? I, I, I'm trying to figure out what you mean. Well, in, in the sense of, uh, of memories, uh, places of memory, uh, they're about the people interacting with each other very often uh, in a battle, uh, in a ceremony, uh, in, a, in a wedding or in, in a courtship uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you just uh, portrayed. What, how, how important is, is it for, uh, for your art uh, to, to kind of capture those uh, those kinds of relationships, the power of those relationships. Well, each one of those types of events and, and relationships make us who we are. You know, you're, you, again, you're, you're, tearing, you're telling a narrative of somebody's life and how they became who they are. Yeah, you know, again, it, it could be the, the, the food that they taste, the places that they've been in shared experience or non uh, shared. Those things make us who we are as as a person and as an artist i'm trying i depict those Im images the best i can to express that and, and again sometimes people get those and sometimes they don't but uh, it's it's just one of those things that uh, it, it, it either speaks to you or it doesn't and uh and it, it's one of those things that you you either feel or you don't and um uh, but as, a, as an artist, you know, the only thing we can do is just portray it the best way we possibly can. And that person's either gonna feel it or they won't. And, but again, all through my artwork, I always try to tell stories of moments and events that had happened, not only to, to an individual, but a, the tribe as a whole, or just an experience of, uh, 
again, like the first time somebody hunted a buffalo or the first time they scalped somebody or even the courtship, you know, each one of those is an event of love, compassion, uh, food, you know, things that mean something to them at that moment in time that, you know, you're, you're basically capturing a moment of time. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Do you keep track of all, all your works and where they are? Do you feel connected to that work after it's moved on? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's strange, but you, you do. It's, it's almost, because I don't have any kids, but it, it does feel like a kid, you know, and when you see it, I remember the, you know, I've seen old pieces. I'm like, wow, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm kind of shocked because I'm like, that's where I came from. You know, that's part of me. That was part of what came out of me is right there, but that I'm no longer right there. I'm, I've since moved on, but yet it's always nice to revisit old pieces because I, I remember, and it also kind of puts me in a frame of mind, what I was thinking of at that time when I, when I did those. And, uh, and when I see stuff that I've done, you know, right out of college and five and 10, 15, 20 years ago, it just kind of, those, those flood of memories all come back to me. And it's like literally seeing an old friend, you know, and only that, but some of these pieces, they go to places I'll never go in my life. You know, there's pieces that are in Japan, England, Germany, Austria, South America, you know, different countries and Africa, you know, all over the place. And, and so in a way I'm getting those words out and, and those images out about who I am and, and where I came from, because people are going to have that thing hanging in their house and they're going to showcase it. And somebody's going to come in and go, where did you get that? Oh, that's a, that's a Brent Lerner piece. He's a Cheyenne Arapaho from Oklahoma. And this is the, this is what he told me about this piece. And seeing again, it goes back to, I, I'm selling, not only that, I'm selling a little heritage of, my, of, of who I am. I'm selling those stories of my ancestors and depicting those because those are now living all over the place. They can never be squashed. So again, those pieces are in countries that I'll never go to, places I'll never see. Uh, but when I do see them, it is like seeing an old friend. Thank you. All right, next question. If there are places of memory that can be visited in art, are there also times of memory and timelines of memories over the years that can come out in art? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm watching Loki right now after I get finished with this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, but no, no, you, you can because, you know, with, with, with places of memory, it's literally, it's, it could be anything you want it to be. Because again, it, it's how it speaks to you. And, and with the different time uh, frames and everything else, those all speak to different people, you know? And again, and that's, you know, in some way, uh, the subtext of some of the, the images I've done, I've literally reached back into time to pull those things forward to tell stories of the past. Again, of the Picasso, the Monet, some of the famous artists that I replicated and, and changed up the narrative to a native uh, a view, but telling it in a native uh, uh, story. Because again, I, the, the stories I'm telling are over 150, 200 years ago. So yeah, they, they would be uh, places of, of time and, and, and not only that, but of moments of things that make, make us who we are. Because it is the butterfly effect. Okay. Um, your piece inspired by Picasso's Guernica inspired me to go back and read about the painting again. In one of the references, the author stated that Guernica is known for placing the activist role of art in the public eye. I found this Picasso quote that you might be familiar with and would like to hear if it speaks to you in any way. And here's the quote. Painting is not done to decorate apartments. It is an instrument of war against brutality and darkness. Yeah, especially for that piece, you know, the, the one that I did uh, that's a take on his was about Sand Creek, you know, because again, you know, you, what happened at Sand Creek? You know, when you when you actually read the testimony of uh, a soul and Kramer, 
and you and, and you when you when you read those you can picture them in your mind of what what kind of tragedy actually happened and and to put it in in that place of Guernica with Picasso on how he did that style because the way he did it was just it, it is a powerful piece and and so all I did was just basically replicate what he did but just changed up the narrative of it and so that quote does that does speak volumes to me because again that was one of those things that when after I did it I'm looking at it and going wow that is that's a powerful piece and I did read that quote so for the folks in the audience who find this a fascinating question, uh, join us for the panel discussion coming up. When is that, Sarah? June 30th, uh, because we're going to be looking at uh, Brent's piece and looking at Guernica and the role of this sort of, uh, these sort of depictions well, you, you know, real quick on that, on Sand Creek, you know, I'm a descendant of Sand Creek. You know, I'm related to Black Kettle on my Cheyenne side. And to, to know the atrocities that happened at Sand Creek, you know, really speak to, to who I am, you know, because somebody survived down the line to where I'm here to tell you their story. And, and to do a piece that is telling us, telling an event that happened over 160 some odd years ago, you know, that's not that long ago when it comes to the, the uh, to, to, uh, to time. You know, mom, when she was growing up, she would tell us the story about how she would always wear her moccasins, you know, her shoes, even when she went to boarding school, you know, they would, they would beat her when she spoke her own language. And, you know, you hear these stories growing up and you're like, you know, you can't believe that actually happened, mom. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my childhood. I didn't get, but, but again, I, I didn't grow up in the late, you know, in the thirties, like my mom did. I wasn't taken away from her parents. I actually got to spend time with my mom. She was taken from her parents, taken to boarding school. And she would tell us these stories about how she was gone pretty much almost all year round and they'd only come back for, for three or four weeks out of the year. And then a, a big day for them was they would get a new dress. Basically a new dress to them was an old dress from the white ladies in town that would come out on a truck and just hand them over and say, here you go, here you go, kind of like rations. And so I've got a picture of my mom when she was 16 wearing this dress that was given to her. She was really proud of it because that was the only new thing that she had had. And again, you know, I'm hearing these stories growing up and it wasn't that long ago. And, and, and when, you, when I think back to, to Sand Creek, when that happened in 1864, for me, that was only four or five generations. And so knowing what happened not so long ago, not to say it can't happen again, but those stories need to be told. They need to be shown in art because one of the things when my cousin and I put together that one November morning exhibition, we looked at what visual information was out there for, for people who didn't know anything about Santa Creek to look at. Hell, there was only three things. That was it. But from our exhibition, there ended up being about 35 different images that people could reference and look at and an experience of, of the heartaches and, and the traumas that had happened at Sand Creek. So I, I would I would definitely encourage a lot of people to look at that exhibition. Not only that, but just, you know, when we have the next discussion, you know, just kind of keep in mind what, what, what Sand Creek means to Colorado and what it means to U.S. history, you know, because it's the only national monument that has the term massacre in it. And it's right there in Colorado. You know, you know, and like I said, one of the things that uh, amazed me was how, how little uh, people knew about the Sand Creek, you know, about how the soldiers came back after the, after the massacre and had body parts doing a parade right down the street there in Denver. Hell, that's probably the same street that they celebrated the Super Bowl. A few years ago when the, the Broncos won, they probably celebrated on that same street, you know, 
And again, it shows you how far we came, but there's, there, there's so much more we can do to move forward. Yeah, I, I think one of the things uh, that uh, is kind of marks uh, how far we've come uh, is that uh, there seems to be a, 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 at least some uh, awareness that these narratives uh, in, in the past have been, have served uh, very often to erase the memories mm -hmm. of uh, the, the people who were uh, the victims of a massacre or who were the victims of uh, uh, the boarding schools, et cetera. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I, I think for, for me, it, it really ties in uh, in a very powerful way, the role of people who keep the memories uh, in their heads, in their hearts, in their souls, and are sharing that uh, uh, through stories. Uh, because ultimately it will, uh, the reportage uh, of uh, Guernica did reach Picasso, and he did in response to that reporting uh, of, 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 of the events there, uh, moved him to uh, create uh, that piece. Uh, and, and, and people very often uh, mistake uh, Guernica as being the first of these types of uh, uh, atrocities where uh, modern technology, air, aircraft, in this mm -hmm. case, used to, uh, to bomb uh, uh, in, innocent villagers. But uh, it happened in, uh, in Abyssinia. The Italians did that earlier. And in, uh, even in Spain, it happened earlier. Uh, and so Guernica was, if you will, about the, the, the third example of these kinds of, uh, of, of, of acts. But that's the one that gets to be memorialized. Yeah. Because of the con convergence of, of artists and the story and, and, and the, just that uh, raw emotion and the kind of commitment to use the art to, as uh, Christina Webb said, to uh, you know, basically fight uh, uh, brutality and darkness. Well, just take a look what happened here in Oklahoma in 21. You had the, the bombing of uh, Black Wall Street. A whole city was taken out, and they were bombing them. You know, they, they were bombing them. They were they would literally fly in and, and drop bombs in and on the Tulsa side, which is on the black side of Tulsa. And it literally wiped out a whole district, a whole area, a whole, basically a, a city. And you didn't really hear about it growing up here in Oklahoma. I, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, a lot of my friends and I have been talking about that growing up here in Oklahoma. They go, when did you learn about it? I said, I'll be honest. I said, I, I didn't hear about it until I was probably in seventh grade when they did a, a PBS special on it and we had to do a book report. And then again, more in depth, when I was a sophomore in high school, when they instituted Oklahoma history to where all kids who were going to public school had to study Oklahoma history. And even then, you only, they only talked about it for three or four days and they moved on. And so you really never got that in-depth uh, discussion of what really happened and and uh you know now you know even today kind of an historic day where you had the senate to uh, pass the uh juneteenth to make it a federal holiday you know things like that are now starting to come to light to where things are starting to change and, and move in a, in a good direction where people are starting to learn things about the past they didn't know and and one of the things they really need to do is to have um, in in all public schools around the country a kind of a you know a kind of a mandatory where you you learn about African American history, American Indian history, 
and even Asian history to kind of get a sense of what all the, the people from around the country who, who end up making America what it is, kind of learn what, what kind of struggles they, they had to go through and that we're still going through, you know, with, with the uh, missing indigenous women movement, you know, it's just now starting to pick up some speed to where people are, 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 are starting to hear more, especially here in Oklahoma where they, they passed the, uh, the, Ida, the Ida Bell uh, law to where they're going to start trying to keep uh, statistics on that. And, um, you know, there, there's, th there's things that we can improve on as, as a people. And again, these all deal with places of memory because, again, that's what makes us who we are. And again, it goes back to that butterfly effect where one thing happens and another and another. And you remember these places. And, and when you first heard about it, you know, I remember as a kid, dad was talking about the first time he heard about the, the sinking of uh, the Bismarck. Mom, she remember where dad was when Kennedy was shot. You know, and those things resonated because they, 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 were, they were powerful moments in their lives to where they, it, it affected not only them, but people around them. And, and again, some of the pieces that I depicted in this exhibition, those are pieces that to me, you know, reflect uh, moments of, uh, of memory, places of memory that I wanted to express. Because again, you know, uh, when Jean said, it, she reached out to me two years ago, literally that was, that was about two to uh, a year and a half in the process of, of depicting these pieces, literally just for this exhibition because I, I wanted to give it a, a proper place. Because again, it goes back to what my mom and dad always said, you gotta know, you gotta know where you came from to know where you're going in life. And, uh, and so I wanted to have a narrative of telling stories about what happened to and for my Cheyenne Arapaho people. Thank you. So we have a forward looking question for you. What can we see next from you? Oh, um, well, I, you know, right now I kind of dabble in uh, a little of everything. And so, you know, my, my next show that I'm going to be doing will be, you know, at the Santa Fe Indian Art Market in August. But outside of that, I'm going to be doing a one man show in uh, Oklahoma and we're going to put that online. And uh, it's going to be kind of a, a kind of a pop uh, art show. And um, with that, I'm going to try some some different types of uh, paintings, you know, because each show, I, I like to try to do something different to tr try to express myself just uniquely just for that show, but keep that same narrative of telling the story of the Shine Arapaho and and being true to some of the, the narrative of those stories of, you know, where I came from, what had happened, you know, I was thinking about doing a series on you know, my mom's experience when she was going to boarding school, you know, what it was like, because before my mom passed away, I, I recorded her for my brothers and sisters, because I really wanted to know what it was like for mom growing up as a little girl to the woman she became, and to hear some of those stories, and when I was interviewing her, it was, it was, you know, mom would literally tell me to stop recording, and she'd sit there and cry. And she, she would go, Brent, you know, it, it's hard for me to remember what it was like. Cause she goes, I kind of want to forget the, if I feel like it was a, a different, different person, a different life for me, because, you know, things are different now. You know, you gotta realize when my mom and dad got married in the, uh, in the early fifties, their, their uh, marriage was against the law. You know, it was, it was against the law for a white man to marry a native. You know, they got married in 1952. They had 10 kids. And one of the stories mom told me when they first moved to Oklahoma, and, and this is kind of a powerful one at, at that, when they first moved to Oklahoma, the house that I grew up in, the, uh, the lady wanted to throw them a, a housewarming party. So she invited everyone over to the house. Well, two years before they bought the house, my father was stationed in McAllister, Oklahoma. They were driving down to, to McAllister. My mother was pregnant with my oldest brother. It was raining. 
dad said he couldn't drive. He, he was getting tired. So they pulled off into a, a hotel. Dad was a Marine. He walked up and, uh, the guy goes, uh, he goes, is it one? He goes, no, he, I have, my wife is in the car. He goes, sorry, we don't let blacks in this hotel. And she was, well, she's, she's not black. She's, she's Indian. He goes, we, we don't let them eat either. No dogs either. And so my dad came out and told mom, uh, I'm sorry, honey. Uh, they're, they're all booked up. He got in the car, drove to McAllister. There was a traffic jam. My mom went into labor. It just happened to be the car behind him was a doctor. He delivered my brother right there on the road in, in McAllister, Oklahoma. Now to fast forward two years when that lady was throwing that housewarming party. Everyone comes. Mom's answering her door. Hi, how you doing? My name's Juanita. This is my husband, John. Hi, how you doing? Well, she opened the door and then she slammed it and ran back to the back room crying. Dad went back there and he goes, what's going on, sweetheart? Uh, is anything, anything wrong? And mom goes, just, just tell that guy to go. Dad goes, well, what is it? And she goes, no, no, just tell that guy to go. And so dad walked to that front door and opened it up. It was a guy two years earlier who told him they didn't have room at the hotel. Dad said, you better get your ass off this porch. Otherwise, I'm going to beat it all the way to that driveway. The guy didn't realize who he was. And dad goes, you remember that blonde hair, blue eyed Marine? That was me. The one you refused service, especially to my wife who was pregnant. You need to get the hell off my porch. The guy jumped off, took off running. And to show you how small this world is, 30 years later, when my mother was a, the chairperson for the Cheyenne Arapaho, she literally would have a day where people would come in who needed assistance and she would talk to them. This guy walks in, has his paper, says, uh, you know, I, I need assistance. And mom looked at him and she goes, you know what? You look familiar. And she asked him, you know, a couple of questions and he was just, he was on hard times. Come to find out he was the owner of that hotel that refused service to her. He was also the gentleman who came and dad was going to, beat the hell out of because it was the same guy here it is 30 years later he's coming to my mom because he was half indian my mom didn't do what he had done to, to her he goes I, i'm going to show you something we're going to have i'm going to give you a lesson he goes she goes i am going to help you something you didn't do for me 30 some odd years ago i'm going to do it for you and the guy broke down crying he, he goes I, I regret doing what i did to you ma'am and you know, I'm I'm just glad you're showing me mercy. And again, and it shows you how small this world is, and how we're all connected, and and that we're all we're all human. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes you 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 correct what you you you've messed up. But when my mom told me that story, my brother was right there because he worked with the tribe at the same time. He goes, "Yeah, mom, mom did that for that guy." And I'm thinking, if that were me. I wouldn't help that son of a bitch. But then again, I, you know, mom, that's how mom was. Mom always, she always helped out a lot of people. When matter of fact, when she died, it was just going to be us, just, you know, just the immediate family. But we had close to 900 people who came to the funeral. People who didn't even know my mom came to pay respect because they knew how good she did for the tribe and how, how she helped try to help everyone she possibly could. And so, again, that's one of those things that was ingrained in me to, to always try to push and try to get the most out of myself, but people around me. And, and again, you know, with this exhibition, I, I was very appreciative of you, you asking me, Gene. And, and again, it was an honor. And I, I'm, I'm glad that I, I did it because, again, it, it really speaks to the heart of, of what I do as an artist. You know, telling that story for for my ancestors who didn't have a, a chance to tell that story giving them a voice that will will be be here you know it's like you asked that question you know earlier about you know seeing old paintings well when i'm when i'm dead and gone from this world those paintings will be alive spreading that message all around the world 
So again, it's just it is like seeing a seeing a kid. Well, we're delighted that uh, you wanted to be part of this show, and there was a reason we invited you. You know, we knew we knew you through your the work you did with one November morning, and so when we came up with the theme of places of memory, um, we were just it was a natural to to have you be part a big part of this exhibit. So thank you so much for that. No, well, thank you guys, and uh, and again, it was it was it was an honor to to be a part of this exhibition because you know one of the things i i have i've done in my career is i've gotten to actually travel around the country and, and around the world and you know one of the places i had gone was uh, to siberia and, and work with some some um, siberian uh, indigenous people there because they actually have a story that uh where part of their tribe went eastward to follow the the, the bison and never came back. And, you know, and I'm hearing this story, you know, yeah, granted, I believe in the the uh, the Barren Strait and everything, but to literally, when I went to the Barat Museum and, and to see some of their artifacts, man, it'd be like going to, to any museum here in, in the Plains. You go in there, they, they have a teepee. They have like buffalo hides. And they, I didn't know they had buffalo in, in Siberia, but they do, they're kind of short hair, or no, they're long haired buffaloes, but they're shorter. They're not as bulky and as big as they, they are here in the in the North America, and uh, but they, you know, they have this, this uh, singing. It's a throat singing. You know, I'm pretty sure you guys have heard it. And the way it starts out, it, it literally sounds like, you know, Plains Indian drum beat. And I'm sitting there, I'm listening to it, and I'm like, wow, this is so familiar to, to me. Not only that, but to see how they they buried they're dead i'm like that's how the arapaho used to do it they used to wrap it up and, and set them up on on rocks and then and they they moved from that to scaffoldings to where they would wrap them up and put all the belongings of the the deceased under underneath them up high and i'm like it, the the imagery that i saw over there is so familiar to what i see in every plains indian museum here in um, north america it was just it was chilling and um, and the, the, one of the reasons I went over there was it was a project I did with the University of Oklahoma called Peer to Peer and how the Barat people have the same DNA that North American Indians have. So it goes back to where they were related to them distant way back. And again, that's one of those places of, of memory to where seeing that stuff reminded me of what it was like for us here you know and so again it's that uh, that theme is is kind of endless on how i see art and how i experience life because the world's so small that you're going to run into people that re that you remember as a kid and, and you hear stories that remind you of this and that that it, it, it it's a beautiful theme that you had So we are uh, closing in on 8.30, which is our end time. I just wanted to um, read you two comments, not questions, but comments that ended up in the chat room. Because um, I think they're, I'd like to share these with everyone. I agree with Brent that our history is America's history and it should be taught from Teresa. And someone uh, <laughs> suggesting, you really should go visit your kids. <laughs> <laughs> and you may not be able to get to all of them in Japan and Great Britain and all those faraway places you mentioned, but we are making a good home for some of your kids. So right. <laughs> whenever you are in Denver, you are more than welcome to come visit your children. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I apologize earlier because I, I had what I was going to say on, on my tablet and my tablet just kind of went awry. And so again, I, I apologize for that because I usually like to have uh, things uh, in proper order. But uh, but you know, again, the, you know, growing up with with the parents that I had, it, it it just it kind of made my life easy as an artist because I, I was able to pull some of what my mom would tell me 
and from watching my dad because he would he kind of formed me into the artist I am now and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a very fortunate um, man to be doing what I'm doing and um, and again I could I could literally talk about you know my mom and and some of some of her stories because you know growing up with a, a strong woman figure who really impressed it upon me to really research being shy in Arapaho because again a lot of what she knew she had lost and so I think by pu pushing me into find out who you are for her it was almost you know her having amnesia and so when I would tell her she would go I remember that because one of the times we went to a powwow a woman came up to her and she started talking to her in, in fluent Cheyenne and mom would shake her head and she would answer her back and when she walked away and I said did you know what she she said and she goes oh I I understand those words but she goes Brent for me I used to talk like that but I, I'm scared to, to talk like that because I feel like I'm going to get hit and because it was really beaten out of me and I could say words but I feel like I I could only say one word at a time and I, I didn't want to do that. And uh, she goes, I really regret not teaching you kids your language. And she goes, so, you know, before you pass, I'd like for you to learn your language. And so I try to, to learn, you know, several words a week. And so hopefully by the time I pass, I'll be able to speak my language fluently. So it'd come around full circle. You know, and again, it's it's one of those things that, you know, you, you grow up in the same household and you as a kid, you don't really ex know what your mom and dad experienced when they were growing up because you only know them as mom and dad. But you didn't know what it was like for them to be young teenagers and, and going through the life that they had. And, you know, and, and hear mom talk about when she was in the, the women's auxiliary unit, how her drill instructor would come in and she would go you white girls don't talk to you black girls and you black girls don't talk to you white girls, especially when you're on leave, you guys are dismissed. And mom and her friend were sitting in the middle and she was like, well, they didn't, she didn't say us. She just said those people. So she goes, when we were in the streets in New York, I'd say, hi, Lucy. Hi, Sarah. Hi. This. And she was like, those other girls were all kind of shocked. Cause then she said, well, she only said you, you white can't talk to you blacks and you blacks can't talk to you whites but she never talked about us red people you know and so again that's kind of the way mom was she always just spoke from the heart and she was always honest and and to, like I said to hear some of those stories it just it was kind of heartbreaking to know that my mom went through some of those things of being discriminated against and you know but she went through that so I didn't have to go through that. And so I'm trying to preserve that to where the next generation, they don't have to get that to where it, it gets easier and easier. But as time goes by, you know, you're starting to see those changes because, you know, I've talked to my oldest brother, what it was like for him going to school. And he would say, oh, they didn't, they didn't let us play on the, the uh, baseball team because we weren't white. We had to go to the, another team to play. But once they saw how good we were, then they wanted us to come back and play for him. And, and, and he came from a generation where they were, there was a lot of segregation. He goes, I remember going to stores where it say no dogs and Indians allowed. And, and you think about it here, it is 2021. You think, was there really signs like that? Yeah, there really was signs like that. And, and again, it, and it plays on that theme of places of memory of, what used to be is no longer there because think at times have changed because of how people it made them feel and how they feel now about that. So, but again, I, I, you know, I could be very long winded. So, you know, I, I don't want to feel like I'm talking your ear off and just kind of rambling about my mom and dad and everything. I'm, you know, I should be talking about the art, but then again, that's what's making me do these things is those stories that I heard growing up because I wanted to tell those stories through my art. And, and in a way I, I, I am doing that. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, your stories. Uh, Brent and Merv will be back along with some other panelists on June 30th. So for everybody in the audience, we uh, encourage you to, if you enjoyed this session, we encourage you to register for the panel for more good stories. No, no, just like come on down. Poised to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brent, for you know helping yes, us uh, yes. get a better sense of everything that's behind the art. Well, and again, I want to thank everyone who who, who watched and and learned a little bit about me and and, and, and about this e exhibit. And if you can take the time to to look at the pieces, read about them, and then uh, and share those. Yeah. Or do you, do your colleagues want to join us for a goodbye? <laughs> thank you, Brent, and thank you, Merv and Jean, for for helping moderate our questions here. It's been so great to hear your perspectives and your thoughts, and um, we're so happy that you could all be with us to, here tonight. Um, I think we're ready to wrap up, so please do. Um, the link is in the chat if you'd like to register for the upcoming panel. And everybody, have a great night. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you for thank you for coming.